Ephesians, please turn your Bible there, Ephesians. John, why don't you turn the AC on over here? It gets cold at night, but warm during the day, when the, especially when the sun's out. Now, the last couple days, sun wasn't out, and we got some much-needed rain. Amen? Much-needed rain. Hello. All right. Ephesians chapter 4. Um, let's look, in fact, let's, let's read our way down to verse 8, 9, and 10, which is what I have up on the screen, so we can get the gist of what's being uh, spoken of. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, remember that's one of Paul's favorite references to himself, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, the prisoner of the Lord, uh, prisoner of the Lord, not for the Lord, but of the Lord. Beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Uh, do not, and I, I have prayed this before, God, please do not let me bring reproach to your name. I do not want to be one of these people that you watch videos on on YouTube where they're wearing some kind of Christian t-shirt and then out of their mouth is every curse word that there is in every known language and I just shake my head and I'm going what are you doing or, or then uh, they'll they'll brag about how Christian they are or whatever and something, somebody, something or somebody will make them mad and they'll start just laying out with curses and threats and I'm going to, I'm going to get you and I'm going to, and, and they say, well, I'm a good person though. I go to church. I go to church. There was one young lady that she worked at a Starbucks. She got a, a, um, somebody's, uh, visa card in her hand and a friend of hers gave her a card reader where she could run that card through and get the name, uh, the name and the numbers off of it and so on. And she then used that. Somebody made her a fake card and she went around using it all over town. The lady who owned the card did some investigating, found out who it was, where she had been, what she had bought and so on. She turned that over to the police department. She gets her phone out she live streamed to Facebook or YouTube or one of the two, live stream, and as she's pulling up ordering from uh, that Starbucks, and sure enough, it's that gal that uh, stole her information, stole her credit card information. And she's like, do you remember me? And the young lady said, no. She said, I'm the gal whose credit card information you stole. And of course, the girl starts, she's only like 19, 18, 19 years old. And she's shaking like a leaf. And she says, I've got you. I've got you on camera. I've already went to all the places where you spent my money. I've already turned you over to the police. I've already turned you over to the corporate people who run uh, this particular Starbucks. And you've had it. And the girl starts pleading her case. But you don't understand. I I'm a good person. I go to church. I'm in the youth group. I, I, I don't do bad things. You don't do bad things, really? People, please. Do not bring reproach to the cause of Christ. Do not bring reproach upon your family. Do not bring reproach upon your church family, your church. Don't bring reproach to the family of God. Don't bring reproach to the name of Jesus Christ. Walk worthy of the vocation. Um, verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the only kind of bonds that we like, is being bound together by peace. I like it. When there's peace in my family, I like it when there's peace in the church. 
I like it when there's peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I like it. I rest easier when things are going well, when people are getting along with each other. It's when people are tussling and fighting and so on. Is That's when I start having a problem. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit. Just keep that in mind. Just because God has given you a certain gift doesn't mean that you're better or special than somebody who does not have that same gift. Remember, it's not the comely parts that are the more important parts of you. It's the uncomely parts. It's my little toe right now that is holding me up and keeping me from falling over, falling down, falling backwards, forwards, leftwards, rightwards. But nobody ever sees my little toe, and I don't want you to see my little toe. It's ugly. Okay? And it's nasty. But it's the, it's the more important part. My dad lost a big toe because of diabetes. And that was, and you just, and he never walked the same after that. You'd be amazed at how much pressure your big toe and little toe can take in the run of a day, but it does. And so just because somebody has a certain gift does not mean that they're exalted above anybody else. The best gifts to have are the ones that go by unseen by men. They're there, they're important, but most men won't see it. You'll never get applause. You'll not get a dinner in your honor. Uh, nothing else. You're not going to get trophies or anything. But you will be blessed by God. Amen? So he gave, uh, what, what verse was that? Uh, one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in y'all. Amen. Paul was from Arkansas. Amen. Y'all and in y'all. But unto every one of us is given grace, listen to this, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Some of you need more grace than others. God's got it. Some of you don't need as much grace as other people do. Don't boast nor brag about it because as sure as you start boasting, God will break you down somehow, some way, and you'll need a lot of grace. Uh, verse 7, but into, well, we've already read that. Verse 8, wherefore, and this is what's up on the screen, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So now we have a, another witness to where Jesus went after his death on the cross. And um, I can remember, boy, the things you remember as a child. I remember... Some adults in this church at a church get together at, at a guy's house having this conversation. And my mom was, if I remember right, she was part of the conversation. She was listening. I was listening. And the question came up, you know, where did Jesus go after he died on the cross? And this man gave the right answer. He said, well, according to the Bible, he went to hell for three days. And, you know, as a little boy, I'm listening to that and I'm going, really? How? I mean, I didn't understand that. So I thought maybe the guy would have been wrong. Incidentally, this same man, his name was Mike, this same man who answered that question, Several years later, um, he had two daughters and a son. Uh, he had a daughter that was a couple of years younger than me. And he had a son who was several years younger than me and a daughter uh, that was born while we were, had just, after we just started coming here. And he quit coming to church and his family quit. 
But then after a while, his wife said, you know what? I ain't dragging my kids to hell. We're going back to church. And they left him and went to church. He struggled with that until his last day. Uh, not too long before he died, his daughter, on a Sunday morning, saw her dad go to the closet and pull a suit out of the closet. And he laid it across the bed and he stood over there looking at it. He finally picked the suit up, put it back in the closet, and laid down in bed. God was dealing with that man. Get back in church, get back in church, get back in church. It wasn't but a while after that. I don't know how long, several months. I don't know. But over here on 110 Highway, heavy fog, very drunk, and his brains ended up in the back seat of the car. Bad accident. One of those that you never see coming. Just boom. And um, I like to think that maybe that was God's last calling to him. Uh, but he, he, got the, he, he knew the answers. He knew the, he knew the verses from the Bible. But he didn't let them take root. Too much sin. Too much sin in his life to give up. So anyway, he, God, Christ led captivity captive. We're going to look at that. And gave gifts unto men. He that ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth. And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Remember, Christ is the most high. So let me... Uh, get a pen here and I'll just circle that far above all heavens that he might fill all notice that he says far above all heavens how many heavens are there Le toi okay Trey amigos there's the first heaven the atmosphere ah the atmosphere the second heaven, which is outer space. Third heaven, it's where God is. And Christ is far above all heavens. He is the most high. Christ is. What did Lucifer say he wanted to be like? I will be like the most high. He's going to be like Jesus Christ. Christ, another Christ, another Jesus, okay? So turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. I got a little bit left. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The word part is there. Members in part. You play a part. Um, John, you play a part. Um, JR plays a part. Melissa plays a part. Chris plays a part. Sparky plays a part, Roy plays it. We all have a part to play in not only in this church, but overall in the body of Christ. There is nobody that God cannot use except those who are too full of pride. God cannot use you because you're so full of pride, you'd like to take all the glory to yourself. You want the limelight to be on you. You want everybody focused on you and so on. God's, God will say, I can't use you. Okay? So he says, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28, now, and God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdarily, I made that up. Teachers, 
After that, apparently Paul didn't know the word fourth. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So what do we have here? Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Looks like we have eight here, unless I counted wrong. First apostles, prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. If the Apostle Paul said that God has set some to be apostles, and then God set some to be prophets, then God set some to be teachers, and God set some that are workers of miracles, and some have the gift of healing, or of helps, or of governments, or diversities of tongues, why is it that we don't see anybody now who we would refer to as apostle so-and-so. Why is it that we don't have in our church a house prophet? I was told years and years ago, somebody asked me, does your church have a house prophet? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, so you know who it is? I said, yeah, it's King James. He said, no, 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 no. You've got to have... Somebody in your church that speaks for God. I, say, I do. I got the Bible. But no, they would, not, they would not accept that answer. They were taught and they believed it that there had to be somebody there. And in, and in the case where I, it, it was a prophecy club tour that I was on. And his doctrine was way out there, I learned. And this guy that ran the prophecy club, Stan Johnson, it was his wife who was the house prophet. Now, get that around your head. And what her job was, what a house prophet's job is, is that if the Lord gives them some message or a sign or a wonder or whatever it is, then they take over the service, proclaim what it is that God did, or that God said, or whatever, and everybody, including the pastor, has to accept that as being, this is what, this is thus saith the Lord. And I was talking to this person, I said, you know, I got a real problem with that. So what that tells me is, is that I have almost no authority in that church whatsoever, that somebody, and in Stan's case, it was a woman who was his house prophet. That means that whatever she said was the word of God. Stan published a, a newsletter every month and he would send it out. And um, I remember uh, about the last time I had anything to do with him, I got one of his newsletters and was reading it. And he had... A prophecy in there in the form of a dream that his daughter had and it was a prophecy from God is what he called it and what he said was that his he put in the newsletter that his daughter dreamed that uh, she could see hell and the part of hell that she could see the most of was all ice and frozen and everything there was snow everywhere it was cold beyond belief and so on and she asked an angel tell me what this is and the angel said to her that this is the place where all the cold dead church people go for eternity so Apparently, hell did freeze over. There's a lot of stuff people's got to do now. But that he believed that that was from directly from God. Her saying that. 
And I went, that's nuts. That's crazy. Bible doesn't say nothing about that. There is no cold place in hell. It's ridiculous. That's right. It's on fire, isn't it? Yeah. Like your bottom's going to be if you don't behave. Uh, anyway, why aren't there apostles? Why are there not prophets? Why are there not people who can do miracles, lay hands on people, and, ha and heal everybody? Why, why isn't that being done now? Why, why don't we have that in our church? Huh? Have the Bible? For what? It's a completed work. Okay? I get what you're saying. Everything that we need is here. Uh, you're in 1 Corinthians 12. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 8 of chapter 13. Charity never faileth. Aren't you glad? Amen. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Which means God's not going to give them anymore. Whether there be tongues... They shall cease. It means God's not going to speak them anymore. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Verse 9, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now think about, think about what he's saying here. At this time, we have men such as Paul, and Peter, we have John, we have James, um, we have Jude, we have Matthew and John Mark and Luke, and all of them are Bible writers. All of them have written a portion of the scriptures, not the whole thing. You're not going to find any reference to one man writing out the entire whole Bible. God started this way back in Moses' day. Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote all about all the accounts that took place in Genesis. How could he write about that, seeing he came uh, 2,000 some odd years later? How is it that he could know all those things. God told them to him. The Holy Ghost came upon him and he wrote down what God said to him. Including, uh, he wrote of the beginning, the creation of everything. He wrote of the flood, the, the de destruction of everything, the reformation of the world. He wrote about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Wrote about the prophecy given by Abraham to his sons. Wrote about Abraham's death and so on. Then my, Moses writes about the Exodus, which he had first-hand knowledge of. Exodus, Leviticus, the law of God, Numbers, the part of the law of God, part of the story of the Israelites going through the wilderness. Uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses apparently even wrote about his own funeral. He either wrote about his own funeral or somebody like Ezra, who was a ready scribe before the Lord, added that last part into Deuteronomy about Moses' funeral that took place. Either way, we still have a man who is speaking by inspiration of God and he's writing down exactly what happened. Okay? We don't know which way it was. We don't know if it was Moses writing beforehand or, or, or Ezra or some other scribe being given uh, the, by the Holy Ghost the words to write down, but we know that they wrote them down and that they are the word of God. So we have the Bible to tell us all these things. So in, in back in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, for we know in part. Moses wrote a part. Um, Ezra wrote a part. David wrote a part. Solomon wrote a piece. Isaiah wrote his prophecy. Jeremiah wrote his prophecy. He wrote the book of Lamentations. Ezekiel had his prophecy. 
Then we have the other prophets. And then we have Matthew, Mark. Matthew only writes one book. Mark only writes one book. John writes how many books? Four? John? First, first, second, third John? Revelation. Five. You got it. You were right. Five. Um, Peter wrote two. First and second Peter. Paul wrote uh, Romans. First and second Corinthians. Galatians. Ephesians. Philippians. Colossians. First and second Thessalonians. First and second Timothy. Titus. Philemon, and we'll throw in Hebrews there just for good luck. What is that? 14? Okay. And then we have Luke. And how many books did Luke write? Huh? How many books did Luke write? He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Okay? So anyway, they all wrote a part of what God gave them. Well, once they wrote it, and the early church started putting it together, the church then had the complete, by AD 100, the church had the completed word of God. They had everything already there. So did they need apostles anymore? To tell them what to think and believe. No. They already had it written down. Do they need uh, prophets anymore? No. The prophets have already spoken enough. They've already dreamed their dreams. They've had their visions. They've had their prophecies. And now their prophecies are over with. What about uh, helps? You think that's still valid? I, I have what I see as a helps ministry. When I go to a different church, uh, I like to help people, including pastors. I'm not there to show that I'm some big know-it-all, but I like to help them, uh, number one, fall in love with the Bible all over again and just have a Bible revival. That's what I'm there to help them with. Uh, there are other people who are very, very good at being a help to other people who really need it, who use the scriptures. It won't be by themselves. They will use the scriptures, but they will be a help to them. We have people that are very gifted and very skilled in government, and I'm not. I'm not an organizer. I'm not an administrator. That's just not one of my spiritual gifts. But anyway, as far as apostles, that, that, that job is taken care of. There are, we do not have any more men alive who have seen and walked with Jesus Christ. They don't, they don't exist. Um, we do have teachers. Um, the Bible says he sent his word and healed them. That's in the Psalms and so on. So verse 29, Paul says, are all apostles. What's the answer? No. Are all prophets? What's the answer? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? You see, here's where you cut into... Pentecostal and or charismatic beliefs. They actually, in order to make verse 29 valid within their system, they must validate the idea that there are latter-day apostles and prophets. They must say that because they're going to come along later and say, yes, all should speak with tongues. That's what they're going to say. 
So to the answer all these questions I've been asking you, you've been saying no, 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 no. You've been saying that one. That's pretty good, wasn't it? While, while our charismatic friends, um, they have to validate tongues because they believe all must speak in tongues or you're not saved. So then if they accept tongues, they must accept workers of miracles. They must accept apostles. They must, must accept prophets and so on. Uh, so have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. Verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So that's 1 Corinthians 12. And then in 13 he talks about um, charity. If we look back in, in uh, verse 9 again of 1 first, of first Corinthians 13. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So I believe that we have that which is perfect. Okay, it, it, it does not need anything else added to it, nor taken away from it. I mentioned to you, it's been a while, but I was watching, a, uh, I think it was in a hotel somewhere, and I was watching uh, Christian broadcasting of some kind, and there was some kind of uh, TV preacher on there, and he was talking to his people. He had a mega church, and he said, now... Uh, the best scholars believe that the book of Revelation was written somewhere around A.D. 60. Okay? And I thought about that for a minute. And number one, uh, that doesn't add up. Uh, because we know that John was placed on the Isle of Patmos as basically, uh, we can't kill him, so we're just going to get him out of the way. They tried to kill John. They threw him in a vat of oil, burning, boiling oil, and he lived. I don't know if I would want to, but he did. And he got over that, and they realized, well, we can't kill him, so we're going to put him away somewhere where he can't have an effect on anybody. Boy, that didn't work either, did it? Revelation is one of the most read books of the Bible. And uh, so John then is able to write what Jesus showed him to write, and he does. And uh, we believe that uh, John died somewhere around A.D. Uh, 95, 94, somewhere around in there. But why does it, why does it matter when John was alive? Was he, uh, did he die in A.D. 60 or did he die in A.D. 96? What does it matter? Thank you for asking. I'll show you. Turn to Revelation. Look there. I'm almost there. Chapter 22. I'll tell you why they made that number up. And they made it up. Look at verse 18 of chapter 22. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book... If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now stop right there. The book he's referring to is the entire book of God, the Bible. If, if John says here, if any man adds unto these words, God will add the plagues that are written in this book to that person. But then you have Paul still writing portions of the New Testament. You have Peter. You have James. You have uh, Luke writing his gospel, writing the book of Acts. If, if all these plagues are going to be cast upon people who have added words to the Bible by putting extra books in other than the book of Revelation... God will hold them accountable and they'll all receive the plagues that are written in the book of Revelation in A.D. 60. But if by A.D. 96, the only apostle left is John. There is no other apostle alive 
They were all martyred. They were all cut down and killed somehow, some way. And so John's the only one left. He's the last one to write in the Bible. He writes the book of Revelation. It's over and done with. He's told that he's going to prophesy it before the nations and all that stuff. And surely that is, that's happening right now, the book of Revelation going all over the world. Um, and after he wrote those words, and here's Jesus, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things. And then uh, look at verse 19, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So if John wrote it in A.D. 60, surely John didn't mean the entire Bible. Nothing could be added to the entire Bible because other apostles were writing there, like Ephesians and 2 Corinthians and so on. But if John didn't write it in A.D. 60, if John wrote it, wrote it in A.D. 96 or 95, somewhere around in there, Surely he's the last living apostle, the last man qualified to write doctrine. And he writes the book of Revelation. And at that point, Jesus says, no more words. No more words after this. Anybody adds words to this, I'll add to them the plagues. Any man takes away from these words, I'll take his name out of the book of life. What makes me scared sometimes to think, I know some good preachers, but they will not yield to the King James. And uh, I love them and pray for them and, and want good things for them. But I would not want to be them. I don't even want to be me on Judgment Day, much less them. Um, so you just, you just pray for people. You do. You pray for people that God will show them the way. So... Uh, are all apostles? The answer is no. Are all prophets? Obviously no. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do we all speak with tongues? No. Do we all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Now, Romans 12, verse 3, and I'll close with this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. This was a really, really big problem for your pastor. Really big problem. When I left here and went to Bible college, I wanted to make a name for myself. And so I had a lot of uh, pride in me. A lot of arrogance. Um, I considered myself better than most of the other students that I went to school with there. And uh, surprisingly, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. Uh, that's the year when one of the guys grabbed me after a particular class and held me up against the wall with his arm up over my throat telling me you ever say anything like that to me again I want to break your neck and all the students standing around watching him and I'm going help, help and nobody helped me and God began to deal with me about my attitude toward other people God began to really, I mean, God used this. This kid was as lost. As, his dad was a staff member of the college I went to. His dad had a position in the college, a high position. So it's like he could get away with anything. And he was, he was a dirty young man. He was. Um, but here's this lost man that I despise that God was using to tell me, Mike, you're too high and lofty. And I won't use you that way. So, needless to say, God has helped bring me out of that for the most part. I won't say that I'm completely done having a little pride and a little arrogance to myself. But we're to think soberly as, according, as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I want you to think about that. 
God measures out grace and he gives it to you. God measures out faith and he gives it to you. And he gives you the faith that you need and only what you need to be who he wants you to be. Um, verse 4, for as, many, uh, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one um, members one of another. So this pinky is directly related to this pinky toe. It's connected to it, isn't it? It's connected to it by way of this bone and this bone and these bones and this bone and this bone and this bone and backbone all the way down my leg bone, down to my foot bone, down to my toe bone. It's all connected together. There's not any part of my body that walks around behind the other part. It's all the same. Uh, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that, notice that, verse 7, let us wait on our ministering. I had to wait to get a position here at this church and that's all I wanted was to be here full time. And I was down at the altar several times crying and boohooing and and, and people would just say, Mike, just wait on it. Just wait on it. Just wait. I don't want to wait. Finally, God let me have it. And I was happy about that. But God made me wait on it. Because he may not be, you might think you're ready. God thinks you're not ready. Or God will say, no, the situation's not ready. I will call you. When the situation's ripe, when you are ready, I will call you and you will minister and, and you will do great and mighty things because you waited. They that wait on the Lord, what? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Amen. So wait on it. Verse 8, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. When you show mercy to someone, don't do it grudgingly. I'll forgive you. But you better not ever do that again. I'll forgive you. But I won't forget. I'll forgive you. But you, I'll never have nothing to do with you ever again. Just forgive people. And be happy to do it. It's not easy. But you can do it with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for coming this afternoon, this evening. Thank you all for coming. Good to be in God's house. Good to be here. It'll be dark by the time I get home. And that's, that's a shame, man. That's terrible. Huh? Till the 21st. And they start getting slowly longer. I got to wait on that too. I, but I'm in no hurry to get rid of wintertime. I'm just telling you, I'm in no hurry. You know what my biggest fear about going to Kenya is I'm afraid that we'll get a really really big snow here while I'm gone I'm afraid that will that will uh, hurt my feelings all right let's go to the Lord in prayer father we love you and we thank you so much for dying on a cross for us we thank you Jesus that you waited just at the right time to manifest who you are what you were here to do and you finally did it 
and you did it at the exact right time. And when you come again, you were going to come again at the exact moment. Not a minute late, not a minute early. It would be the perfect time for you to come. Lord, we look forward to that day. We ask you, God, that you surely, surely, will you come quickly for your people. Lord, bless your word tonight. I thank you for it. I thank you for all these, Lord, that have joined together. Help us, dear God, with our ministry always. Let us be able to reach out and touch those, Lord, who need it. Help us, Father, in every way. We pray in Jesus' name and amen.